John Rice from Ranji University and Mr. Sanjay Nath Singh. He represents the civil society from Consul uh, Consortium of Indian Farmers Association. So I met, uh, I hand over to Professor uh, Subramanian to conduct the proceedings. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shekhar, and uh, thank you, Dr. Fonda, for uh, for inviting me to chair this very distinguished panel. I think I should just step away, and and then uh, let the action begin. Uh, you know, we have a very distinguished panel. Uh, Dr. Ramesh Chand, uh, who was uh, chairing the previous session, is a very distinguished agricultural economist and a policy researcher with a extensive research and training experience as well as being a leader in this area as reflected in his comments. Uh, we have Jean who, who doesn't need much introduction at least to me. Uh, I am at Harvard partly because of Jean. Uh, if he recalls we can, we can talk about that but uh, he's been a leader in development economics and uh, in fact uh, remain an inspiration uh, to do research, evidence-based uh, 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 policy, uh, advocacy, and activism. And uh, finally, we have Sanjay Nath Singh here uh, from the Consortium of Indian Farmers Association, uh, probably giving us the other side of the view. Uh, I thought, like, you know, I would sort of, and this has kept, uh, it kept coming up in the yesterday's opening session a little bit, and then today, uh, from my own public health uh, sort of background, I thought I'll just take, like, uh, five minutes to put a context uh, partly as to why are we talking about food security and these policy and economic growth in general. So I had a uh, uh, few slides here just to sort of uh, show something. Uh, just to motivate uh, uh, a talk a little bit. So as uh, probably all of you know, India has this uh, terrible distinction of being the country with the largest number of undernourished children, whichever way you measure it. Uh, and uh, it, it leads the pack in terms of uh, stunting, underweight, uh, uh, both those chronic markers of undernutrition. Uh, and in India, within India, if you look uh, of, uh, over the time, what's been happening, it's been a very slow reduction in undernutrition. And presumably, you know, food has something to do with that. Of course, there is the role of infection and uh, public water, uh, water supply and sanitation. But there has been a decline, but it's it's hardly something that, um, nothing that compares to the sorts of economic growth that we've had during the same time. Uh, and it's been persistent. I look at Kerala, an example that, that often comes up. Uh, Kerala compares with OECD on practically every other socioeconomic demographic indicator, barring income, of course. Uh, but uh, including even in infant mortality, of course, OECDs have, but Kerala is pretty low except when we look at underweight and stunting, you know. Uh, in these two uh, indicators, Kerala still lags, and uh, it's, a, it's a different question that I want to go into, which is an intergenerational aspect of uh, nutrition uh, uh, growth, and which is much harder than the mortality uh, agenda. Uh, and Kerala also, this is the idea of persistence, like, you know, it has not really seen a dramatic decline. Uh, uh, as one would expect again, given that they had an early start. So we looked at, uh, and this is uh, another slide to say that, you know, again, undernutrition is still, if we think about food, but one of the major proximate risk factors for undernutrition, undernutrition is low birth weight. Uh, that's prenatal. So this is like you're looking at a very wide window. Uh, uh, and I'll come to the point that Rithika was making around PDS. I mean, these are the structural changes that are important to capture a wider uh, window that starts from prenatal to postnatal. And low birth weight, again, India has this uh, terrible distinction of being the highest. And if you look at the sort of the standard conceptual frameworks, food is a big component in terms of when we think about nutrition. So I, I thought, like, you know, we need to get this perspective as Dr. Chand was saying, everything that we do, we need to do it for some meaningful end. And in this case, uh, child undernutrition is a, uh, is a very reasonable goal here. And uh, we did a paper where, you know, there's been this argument that, you know, economic growth should pretty much solve our problems or uh, uh, work our way around it. And I keep surprised that even the most optimistic economists talk in terms of trickle down. Uh, it's never a, like a flash flood that, that comes down the way. So even in a best case scenario, there's going to be only a trickle down to these other, uh, uh, other things. So, so we looked at a paper that we published a couple of years ago for India, 
and uh, using the NFHS data, I'll just show you a couple of pictures. So this is the change in per capita by state uh, by change in the weighted prevalence of underweight, uh, zero correlation. This is the as simple as it can get, and then we ran all sorts of you know, more sophisticated econometric models, but this is the simplest change and change. It's no correlation, absolutely zero. Uh, and if I break that down by poorest, uh, there is nothing going on for the poorest there. And for the richest, there is a little bit of a change, there is, but it's, it, it was not terribly huge, but definitely more than what you expect. So something to sort of put a perspective on again, uh, yesterday we were talking about uh, in the inaugural session around growth, why do we care about growth, which uh, Jean and Sen have articulated very well over the last couple of decades. And we have replicated that analysis in a paper that's coming out next week in Lancet across 37 countries. So that's within country, India. Then we looked at between country. And if you look at this slide, it's just the level of GDP by underweight, which a lot of people show and say, hey, look, there is a correlation. But when you do change on change, there's nothing really going on. Uh, and hence, my case is that there's probably a need for a direct investment of the, uh, of the sort that we can talk about investing directly in things that probably matter for nutrition rather than relying on this uh, growth-mediated strategy, as, as John would uh, phrase it. Uh, and if you look at a, a lot of nutrition-level indicators that, you know, the now published a bunch of things that matter for nutrition, known interventions, and a lot of that deals with food, both in terms of overall calorie and calorie composition. So you need the micronutrients, but in India there's a calorie deficit, you know, that you need to overcome first, and then uh, also care about the micronutrient. And when we do a child nutrition score, this is level, we are doing some work on to see if direct interventions based on an index of nutrition score, uh, availability of these coverages of different things, there's a very, very strong correlation in India. Uh, with child under nutrition, we are doing uh, this more rigorously to see on the change and the change if we can if we can get that again to put that in our perspective. Uh, and again, uh, this is important. Nutrition is because it has a long run impact. It's not just that the child is stunted, and but it affects their uh, what ladder of the society they're going to end up in. Uh, huge impacts on cognition and earning. So even if you care about this from an instrumental perspective. It, it, it matters uh, a lot. And I like to sort of just finish with this thing where, you know, people talk about the demographic dividend and how India with its young population need not worry and, you know, China is the place where you got to worry about. But, uh, you know, it's the quality of the population that also is important, not just the quantity. So if you have a lot of uh, half the kids are stunted, uh, I was looking through this report, and what you find is this is uh, kids who are in uh, grade five, so fifth standard, and they do a age-appropriate test, what should a child know at age five, uh, standard five. And what you find is about only, uh, you know, most of them, there's a huge deficit uh, in most of those population, about a three to four grade deficit is what they, what they observe. And uh, a lot of discussion here has been around schools. And one hypothesis which links to nutrition and food is, well, these kids are stunted. If I have to send my daughter to school hungry, you know, what do I expect? You know, uh, her, her ability to focus, absorb, and so on. So I would just leave it that and then step away from this more very really distinguished thoughts that I, I intend to learn from here. So just to give a very broad public health context to this. Thank you. So uh, I think Jean has to leave early, so I think I would uh, let's start with uh, uh, Jean here. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> in continuation of the last session, I'm just going to add a few footnotes on the National Food Security Act, including some brief remarks on the implications for agriculture insofar as I understand them. Let me first clarify that I'm not a fan of this act. I'm a kind of critical supporter in the sense that it, I think it's better to have it than not to have it. But I have, of course, many criticisms. And I tend to find myself defending it uh, largely because I feel there are many misguided and misinformed uh, critiques. So I find myself defending it when actually uh, I don't feel all that happy about it. But still, I feel something it's an opportunity uh, that we should make the best of. Uh, coming to the act, 
I don't think any sensible discussion of this act can start without first taking note of the extent of hunger and undernutrition in India and reflecting about what the act can do about it, which uh, uh, Subhu has uh, quite helpfully already uh, drawn our attention to. I don't think anyone in, the, in this room needs to be reminded of the extent of undernutrition in India, uh, even if you feel that the international anthropometric standards don't apply to Indian children, which, it is, which is actually quite difficult to substantiate. You still have this massive evidence about low birth weight, anemia, uh, adult women having low BMI, micronutrient deficiencies. I mean, it's a huge cloud hanging over Indian, over the, the country and over uh, Indian development. Now, nobody would claim that the Food Security Act can be the solution to this massive problem, obviously. It, it requires a lot more than that, including, as Subhu has mentioned, direct interventions. It requires clean water, sanitation, healthcare, education, gender uh, relations, all kinds of things. What the Food Security Act can contribute to is three things. One is the end of hunger in the basic sense of an empty stomach, which is a totally unacceptable indignity in the modern world. How many people it affects is not entirely clear. If you go by the National Sample Survey data, it's not a very large proportion of the population, maybe 2 or 3 percent. Other sources that give much higher figures. Uh, in our own surveys with student volunteers, we often ask uh, people w whether they had to ever sleep hungry in the previous three months. And for BPL households, the proportion who say yes tends to be around 20 to 25 percent. So that's a much higher figure. Uh, even if it's 2 percent, it's totally unacceptable. And I think that's one thing that the Food Security Act can do, is to protect, if not everybody, then at least almost everybody from hunger in that basic sense. Secondly, it can give a semblance of economic security to lar much larger numbers of people who may not be hungry but may still be vulnerable to hunger or if not to hunger, to poverty uh, due to illness, crop failures, unemployment, exploitation, death in the family. There are so many contingencies in people's lives and so many sources of insecurity that having some assured resources coming into the house every month from the PDS really makes a big difference. This is one thing we learn when we talk to people in places like Chhattisgarh, Tamil Nadu, now even Orissa, Andhra Pradesh, where there's a functioning PDS and you can see what uh, relief it is for people who live on the margin of subsistence to know that at least there will always be food in the house and they have, don't have to worry about that. And thirdly, it can also contribute to nutrition uh, because as Ritika mentioned earlier, and it's important to repeat it all the time because people keep forgetting it. The act is not just about the PDS, it's partly about the PDS, but it's also about other programs that can have a direct nutritional impact, including maternity entitlements, which nobody talks about, but in some ways it's the most innovative aspect of the act. It's not a large amount, 6,000 rupees per pregnancy, it's not a huge amount, but it is at least an important principle that every pregnant woman has a right to public support so that she can look after herself and ensure that her own child is uh, in somewhat better health when it is born. Uh, and then, of course, there are nutrition programs for children, which are to some extent already in place, but can be consolidated under the Act as legally enforceable entitlements, including midday meals in primary schools, not just primary schools, elementary schools, and uh, nutrition programs in the ICDS. The good news is that there has been a certain amount of progress as far as these programs are concerned in the last few years, which can be consolidated now under the Act. For example, many states have started introducing eggs in midday meals. Uh, I go around with a boiled egg in my pocket these days to make the case for, boiled, for eggs in midday meals and anganwadis because an egg is not only a very useful source of uh, animal protein for children, it is almost a full meal with, with all the required nutrients, calories, proteins, minerals, vitamins, everything you need except uh, vitamin C. And as Ritika pointed out yesterday, if you add a little bit of uh, lemon juice on top of the egg, then you really have a full meal. For children, the vast majority of whom very rarely get a chance to get an egg at home. For the vegetarians, we can provide a banana or a fruit, so that doesn't have to be an issue. Uh, so this is just to illustrate that there is a trend now. Tamil Nadu is giving an egg every day to all children in schools and in Anganwadis. Orissa is giving eggs, I think, twice a week. 
Jharkhand has just introduced an egg once a week. It doesn't always happen on the ground, but at least it's beginning to be put in place. I was very pleased to find a few weeks ago that in West Bengal, or at least in the district where I, where I was, in Birbhum district, uh, children in the Anganwadis were getting three full eggs, sorry, one full egg three times a week, and half an egg with milk three times a week. So this is the sort of interventions that can really begin to make a serious difference to the nutrition of children, and which are now becoming legal entitlements under the Act. Now, of course, all this costs some resources. When we talk about the resources, the first point to remember is a point that has already come to some extent in the previous session, but I think has to be clarified again, which is that the food grain requirements of the Act are lower than the existing levels of procurement. We already have not only 60 to 70 million tons of, tons of food lying right there, but on top of that, about 65 million tons of food being procured every year. Oh, I was going, where is that? Uh, can you show that uh, graph? Um, no. Yeah, this is, the, this is the trend of food grain procurement from the early 50s onwards. You can see that it has been going up and up and up and up year after year, not because you need the resources for the PDS. It's the other way around. There's an autonomous trend of growing procurement as the MSPs are increasing. And the PDS is a kind of, I don't want to say dumping ground, because that would sound negative. But at one time, it was a dumping ground. But it's basically the outlet for what is being procured. Uh, I got the latest figures yesterday straight off the press from the FCI, 2011-12, uh, 63 million tons, 2012-13, 72 million tons, 2013-14, 62 million tons, average for these three years, 66 million tons, and this year again, they're expecting something in the same range. So when you say that we can easily make the extra resources available, you're actually understating your case. We have, the re we have more than the resources, not even counting the stocks that are already there. So we have this huge resource that, that is waiting to be used. And the Food Safety Act, or at least the PDS part of the Act, is largely about making better use of these resources and ending the phenomenal and shocking waste of food that has been happening during the last 10 to 12 years, if not more. If you go back 10 years, uh, when the procurement was around 40 million tons in the early 2000s, at that time, the PDS was a fiction in large parts of the country. There was a reasonably functional PDS in the southern states, to some extent in some of the western states. But in most of the states where it was needed most, including uh, Chhattisgarh, Orissa, Uttar Pradesh, Jharkhand, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, even the BPL households were, were, were getting virtually nothing. And in any case, they didn't really mind, because the price of the uh, food grain that was distributed in the PDS was only marginally lower than the market price. And if you take into account the price difference, it actually didn't amount to very much, which is one reason why there was so much embezzlement, because nobody really was trying to defend their entitlements. Then, during the last 10 years, there has been, of course, continued increase in procurement, outstripping the distribution, which is why the stocks have increased to this extraordinary extent, because the procurement goes up and up. But the distribution is, the BPL quota is basically remains where it is, because the BPL numbers are fixed and the PPL quotas are fixed. So there's a bit of scope for increasing the APL quota, but otherwise uh, the distribution side is not keeping up with the procurement, and that's why the stocks are increasing. So we have seen increasing procurement, some increase in distribution, big improvements in the BPL quota in many states, so that today we have found in several surveys that even in Bihar, even in Jharkhand, at least the BPL households now are getting the bulk of their entitlements. In the survey in 2011, in nine states, we found that the BPL households were getting 84% of their entitlements on average, which is a big progress compared to what used to be the case five years earlier. But in the APL quota, the loot continues. And the APL quota has increased, because the APL quota was basically a dumping ground for the excess stocks. The government didn't know what to do with all this food that was being procured. The BPL quota stayed where it is. So more and more food was pushed without asking any questions into the APL quota, without transparency, without monitoring, without clarity of entitlements. And there are states like Uttar Pradesh, for example, huge state, 200 million people, where the entire APL quota goes straight to the black market. It's all it's known to everybody. The APL households don't even know that they're supposed to be getting food grain. They treat their ration card as a kerosene card or an identity card or something. They don't even expect to get wheat or rice. So that's where 
the uh, corruption continues. This is what we call the uh, APL scam. So that's the context in which now we have an opportunity to use these resources that, that are being generated by the procurement system, ensure that they are much better distributed, that the poorer states get a much be be bigger allocation so that they can have a nearly universal PDS, uh, move away from this failed BPL targeting approach and move to what is called the exclusion approach, which I think Ritika has already described, where basically instead of uh, telling, trying to tell who is below the poverty line, you exclude the rich based on simple and transparent criteria like you know those who have government job, those who pay income tax, those who have a four-wheeler or something. You keep them out and everybody else by default uh, gets a ration card. To reduce the exclusion errors, because the exclusion errors in the BPL approach have been massive, there are at least three independent national surveys which show that about 50% of poor households in India don't have a BPL card. So it's about restructuring the system, bringing more efficiency, more equity, and of course also reforming the system and trying to achieve across the country the kind of improvement that has already happened in Chhattisgarh, as I was as was discuss, discussed earlier, and to an increasing extent in other states as well. How it has happened was asked in the last section, session, so I'll uh, come back to that later if I have time. Um, quickly, the impact on agriculture. So this is when we see things in this light, I don't see any big impact on agriculture. The procurement system is basically unaffected because it is already outstripped what is required for the NFSA. We don't require to increase or decrease procurement. And uh, the quantities being distributed, as you quite rightly said, you said 62 million tons is about right, so maybe just a few million tons more than what is being distributed today. So that is not going to lead to any uh, major change in market prices. So I don't see any a uh, big destabilization of agriculture coming out of this Food Security Act at all. And I think most farmers definitely stand to gain from it, uh, mainly because the majority of farmers in India are small farmers who produce only a part of their requirement and buy the rest on the market. And they will be, of course, benefiting from being able to buy cheap uh, food grain from the uh, PDS. And the other ones are, to some extent, the ones who are benefiting from the, the larger ones, are the ones who are benefiting from the procurement system. So they will not necessarily gain from the Food Security Act, but they are already gaining from the food system, uh, including the procurement system. Two qualifications. Uh, there may be specific states where, because of the Food Security Act, the distribution levels are going to increase quite substantially. And therefore, there may be a downward effect on market prices. I'm thinking particularly, particularly of UP, which is going to get 10 million tons of food grain under this Food Security Act, which is almost twice what it is getting today under the PDS. So you could see possibly some downward pressure on prices in, the, in specific states because of uh, rising distribution, even though at the all India level, the distribution remains much the, remains much the same. That's if the markets are not fully integrated. But it's not clear whether this would be a bad thing, because again, in UP, the vast majority of poor, of poor people, uh, including many farmers, are buyers of food and they would benefit from lower prices and uh, the fact that some large farmers may uh, suffer to some extent from higher prices may be a relatively uh, small price to pay for that. Uh, the other qualification is that it would certainly be true that for the farmers who are either large farmers or who are producing roughly what they consume, it's not a very efficient way of helping them to give them subsidized food grain because it's a bit like procuring from them and then moving that food around the country, storing it for a couple of years, and then giving it back to them at a subsidized price. It's true that for that particular category of people, it may not best be the best thing to do. And ideally, we would have liked them to have something like a smart card so that they can go to the PDS shop and choose between uh, food grain and maybe other commodities like pulses and all. So there's something like that which could perhaps ha happen in the future, which would make the system more efficient as far as that particular group is concerned. But that's not the same thing as to say that that group will lose. Um, of course, it is a fact that farmers in India uh, are, compared to other occupation groups, are losing in the process of growth, and that uh, we need public, policy, public policies to help them, and that the Food Security Act itself will only help some of them. For the other ones, we need other kinds of interventions. We need infrastructure, marketing facilities, cooperatives, power, all kinds of things. The Food Security Act is not 
the answer to everything for everybody. Finally, two more minutes. Yeah, uh, I was going to talk about the uh, obstacles to implement the act effectively. Athletic has already talked about that uh, to some extent, so I don't have to cover that ground again. But I'll just add two points. One is, uh, among other difficulties that we are going to face, I think, is the danger of over-centralization of the PDS under the Act. And this is uh, something that has already happened to the National Rural Employment, Employment Guarantee Act, which actually initially was supposed to be an enabling act, which would permit every state to have its own employment guarantee scheme uh, according to its own uh, policy, um, as long as it was consistent with the Act. And then over time, became more and more centralized and is now basically remote control for Delhi. And my, to my mind, this is not a positive development. So under the Food Security Act, there's a similar danger that at a time when many states are not doing so badly reforming the PDS on their own, there's going to be growing centralization and more and more directive, directives coming from Delhi uh, and a kind of straitjacket being built in a situation where actually every state has different circumstances and capabilities and needs a, needs a certain amount of flexibility. It may be a good thing in terms of putting pressure on the lagging states to speed up their reforms. But it may not be such a good thing from states like, states like Chhattisgarh, for example, which are doing so well and really don't need to be told, for example, by somebody sitting in Delhi that from such and such date, you should switch from a system of household entitlements to per capita entitlements. This is what uh, Ritika has already discussed. Finally, of course, the biggest uh, challenge in this act is to bring about the kind of political change that has made it possible to reform the PDS in states like Chhattisgarh and then later on in many other states as well. And that brings us back to that question that was asked by Amita and others in the last, section, the last session, you know, how come, it, how come it has happened and why are not are other states not doing the same? Now, it's actually quite, I think the Chhattisgarh experience is really interesting because I remember going there in the early, you know, 2000s, finding a PDS that was as corrupt as anything we have seen in Bihar or Jharkhand at any time and that continuing for some time. And then hearing in 2005 from our friend Harsh Mandar, who used to be a district collector in Sarbuja and other districts of Chhattisgarh, telling us that one thing that will never improve in Chhattisgarh is the PDS, because we have really tried and we've not been able to confront the nexus of corruption that is, has grown around the PDS. And then suddenly, two years later, the government, for its own political reasons and basically an for as in you know, by way of electoral strategy, decided to reform the system and make it work for people rather than for these corrupt middlemen who are milking the system. And then within two years, we see you know, sweeping reforms, the deprivatization of prayer price shops, doorstep delivery, broadening of the, the system, lower price, computerization, SMS alerts, helplines, grievance redressal, and of course, a lot of people also being sent to jail who are still trying to profit from the system. Now. Uh, so it was not just an administrative reform. It was really a crackdown with a huge political backing. Now, that, of course, then when people hear that, then they say, well, then we can't really hope that this will happen elsewhere, and what if it doesn't happen elsewhere? But in fact, it has happened gradually in many other states as well, partly because they saw what was happening in Chhattisgarh. They saw that Raman Singh became known as Chawal Baba and came back to power twice, and they thought, well, maybe it's actually not a bad idea to try to make system work for the people rather than for the corrupt middlemen. And I think that actually this trend is what you would expect to happen sooner or later in a minimally democratic society where people have some voice because, you know, the, the loot that was going on earlier is, you know, criminal robbery on a huge scale. And you don't expect people to take that line down forever. So sooner or later when people have more voice, and of course, they had reasons to have more voice also because the market prices were increasing. So the stake that they had in the PDS, that was a very big factor, that the market prices increased and therefore it became, you know, a much the stakes really increased for people and then they started learning about their entitlements and fighting, fighting for them. And we are beginning to see that happening in many other states as well, including even Bihar and Jharkhand and hopefully one day also in UP. I really hope that will happen. But I think that's one of the biggest question marks on the act. Are we going to... You know, because UP will get 10 million tons of food grain, and if it doesn't go through these reforms and make a good job of the act, it will give it a really bad name. So uh, the struggle will have to continue full blast. 
Thank you, Sean, very much. Uh, I just had a very quick and then, uh, so do you see this in all the states that have come up newly? Like is, is or no, not, there's no, like states that have broken away from their larger one, it's not see, a pattern actually, there. actually, to be fair, even UP, even in UP, the BPL quota has been radically transformed. Ten years ago, I remember when I went to Allahabad in 2002 and then I went around the district, people were getting nothing. Now the BPL households are getting pretty much, if not 35 kilos, at least 32, 33 kilos. That, that is a big breakthrough. So even in UP, things are moving. But I think that to go from there to the step where, you know, most of the food grain reaches people and this APL scam is uh, tackled, I mean, I think there's still some distance to go. So I think, sorry? The point that you made, yeah. that the fact that some of, but when you have these new states, right, the, the Jharkhands, the Chhattisgarh, and the Uttarakhand, do you see this pattern being much more receptive to reforms in the small states, or is just uh, Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh were both new states, but Jharkhand is very different. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, but maybe like some opening remarks from uh, Dr. Chant for his your uh, thoughts on this panel discussion, and then we will move to uh, uh, Dr. Singh. No, just generally, like, let's sort of have what you have to say, uh, Olaf, and then we can discuss between each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I, in fact, uh, would be speaking on uh, uh, different aspects than what uh, Jan has done. Uh, no point in uh, repeating what he has said. I agree with him on uh, most of the points. And, uh, Oh, I see. Uh -huh. oh. Uh, <clears throat> the first uh, point which I want to make is that uh, we find that uh, there is a lot of genuine concern about food security in all the country. It should be there. But if we look at its conceptualization, its measurements, I find that there is a complete mismatch between the two. And I also find that there is a mismatch between theoretical conceptualization of food security and practical or applied aspects of food security which look at actual or different dimensions of food security. Now if we look at definition, uh, the most accepted definition now given by World Food Summit which is accepted by different country, it is so comprehensive and I would like to just briefly read it, that food security exists when all people at all time have physical, social and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So this is the theoretical definition of food security. When we look at the indicator no indicator has been developed in India or by international agency that corresponds to different elements within this definition. Now this definition I find is not only comprehensive that this is something ideal, ideal state because nothing is left that adequate food for everyone throughout the 365 days it should also be safe, it should also be according to preference of the person, it should also be nutritious and the ultimate outcome should be person leads active and healthy life. When we use the applied dimension, when we look, if I look at the applied dimension, how we look at this, we reduce it, so equally there is a contrast between definition which is so comprehensive and ideal and the actual indicator we use. I think we start looking at what is the dietary energy intake, how many calories a person is consuming. That is what FAO uses, that is what India uses and that is what most of the country uses. And I find that these are two extremes and that's why I said that there is a mismatch between the concern which are expressed about food security and its conceptualization. Like if you ask a researcher, now what do you mean by food security? I think nobody have a precise or clearly definable uh, idea about this food security at present. That is what puzzles me that we are expressing so much concern, but
but like poverty one may disagree with this that there is a definite uh, dimension that if income of a person is lower than this the person is uh, is poor so so one could raise that level but there is definite indicator in the case of food security unfortunately we completely abandon this definition when we start measuring food security and we reduce this broad concept of food security simply to dietary energy intake that if a person is consuming energy as per the norm which again varies at for different fao says it is 1800 kilo calorie in india we use icmr nin norm of 2400 kilo calorie for rural population 2200 kilo calorie for urban population and if we find that a person is consuming that much energy we say he is having adequate nutrition food security is fully taken care so not to worry so this is my first concern that food security in its true sense need to be measured by a much broader indicator then what are the indicators in vogue or what are the indicator in practice and this is also a challenge to the researcher that we need to develop or we need to propose that indicator which can capture different dimension which are given in the definition of food security in fact one could say that there is an indicator already global hunger index but i find that indicator to be very <laughs> funny because uh, because uh, 75% of the weight is given to children rest of the total population get only 25% weight because it is simple average of three indicator percent of people who are undernourished are not consuming minimum dietary energy uh, as per the recommendation child mortality and uh, uh, i think uh, uh, stunted children or something like that so this is i think first thing that since there are many researcher who are working in this area i have also asked my uh, a scientist at my center to work in this area that let us develop first an indicator of food security which is quite comprehensive which is not restricted only to calorie intake which also look at vitamin which also look at protein which also look at uh, minerals and also uh, uh, different dimension of uh, food safety nutrition and like that so this is the first point which uh, i want to make then second thing which uh, uh, again i find uh, is doing uh, some violence to food security that fao and many other agency even in india we use the terms food security under nutrition and hunger interchangeably so if say say uh, a person is not consuming adequate calorie we go to the extent of putting him in the category of hunger whereas i feel that hunger is a extreme form of deprivation so if a person is required as per norm to consume 2200 kilo calorie and he consumes say 2000 i think it is not proper to call him hungry hmm? so so we need to draw this differentiation that we need to draw a differentiation between undernutrition and hunger uh, just to say that uh, anybody who is not consuming minimum kilo calorie uh, as per the norm is a hungry person uh, seems to be uh, i think creating a confusion uh, about this uh, uh, this uh, nutrition then third is about norm again there are uh, very wide uh, variation the fao uses a norm of 1800 kilo calorie and in the case of india if we make adjustment for gender age activity we did a recent paper we find that average for india come close something to 140 kilo calorie so in terms of norm of fao and in terms of norm of icmr uh, national institute of nutrition there is a difference of only 25% but this 25% makes lot of difference to incidence of undernutrition like uh, most of you might have read paper by angus ditton and jan dres so they estimate that in india the incidence of undernutrition based on dietary energy intake is 75% but according to fao for the same year the incidence of undernutrition was only 21% so fao using the 1800 kilo calorie says in india in 2004 5 only 20% people were hungry or undernourished but according to study by jan dres and angus ditton the percentage was 75% 
So it is opposite that what was nourished was same as what Afro says was undernourished. So huge difference. Partly because norms are different. FAO use 1800 kilocalorie. In India, average is 2200, close to 2200 calorie. And partly it is because of that norm. And also, I think there are other reasons also that FAO estimate under nutrition based on supply, as I mentioned in previous session, that they presume that 87.5% of food grain produced in any country goes as food, whereas actual maybe 70% are like that. So huge difference between the two. The second difference between, because FAO regularly in their state of food insecurity published that what is the incidence of undernutrition in different country, it shows that over time the incidence of undernutrition is declining. Whereas study by Jan Drez and Deaton shows that it has not declined. I think between 83 and 2004-5, their study indicate that there has been an increase of 10 percentage points. From 64%, it has increased to 75%. FAO says that it has declined over time. Um, uh, steadily, it has been declining. For some period, only four or five years, uh, the, the decline was not there. Otherwise, throughout, they are showing that there is a decline. I think this is another that we need to resolve it, that why FAO indicator shows that there is a decline in uh, undernutrition and it is as low as 20%. Uh, Their recent estimate is only 17.5%. Whereas the study which we do in India, it is not that much, it is quite high, 75% according to uh, Dredge and Deaton. And we also did a paper recently that even if we use 2009-10 data, it turns out to be 64%, 65%. So, so this is uh, another, I think, serious issue that international agency is showing one result and uh, national agency are showing uh, another result. The third issue which I want to highlight is disconnect between agriculture growth and the estimates which we get on undernutrition or hunger. I find that FAO estimates, though they are underestimates, seem to be consistent with the growth rate in food production. In India, you take last 20 years or 30 years, there is increase in per capita production and also in per capita availability of most of the food commodities except pulses. Now, one may question that if nutrition is not improving, where is this food going? So there is this disconnect between agriculture growth and this nutrition that per capita production, per capita availability of all food in India is increasing except pulses. I am emphasize except pulses. But if you look at the other increase, that is much higher to compensate for reduction in pulses. Like you look at milk, increase in milk production, which, which is now 120 million ton, even if milk contain 4% uh, of the protein, you just find that it compensates much more then what is the reduction due to per capita availability of pulses? So one may say that if the economic studies are showing that there is a deterioration, then where has food gone? In fact, since I worked in ICR system, I am confronted by those people all the time. You tell us where has food gone if there is no improvement in the nutrition. The third uh, issue which I want to uh, uh, highlight is that uh, our estimate or our indicator of food security are highly serial centric. In fact, they are just indicating whether we look across a state, whether we look over time, that whatever is the pattern in serial, same pattern you find in the case of nutrition. That in India, mm -hmm. Over time, even though per capita availability of cereal in most of the period, except some brief period, has been improving, people's preference to consume cereal has been declining. Why it is so? When cereal are available in the country, why people don't want to consume it? And that is also in sharp contrast to many other countries, where you just find that, uh, that when economic condition improve, per capita income increase, uh, economic transition takes place, you just find that dietary transition takes place, cereal consumption, particularly for indirect use, meat, eggs increase, 
so as a feed component it increases so per capita total intake of cereal increases so india those kind of things are not happening and many jaisi they are calling it indian puzzle indian enigma indian paradox that income are rising per capita income are rising and even for poor also income are rising then why this nutrition is not improving why their dietary energy intake is not showing uh, this improvement and why calorie intake is uh, not uh, not uh, uh, arising then in our study we also look at what is the this uh, this uh, uh, incidence of undernutrition across income category income classes we were surprised that if we use the norm and adjust it for gender activity and sex uh, uh, and uh, and age even in the top 20% expenditure classes top 20% expenditure classes you find high incidence of undernutrition and in our paper we call it is it a blunt hunger that that okay there is a people at the low income level we can say they can't afford to buy adequate food that's why they are not consuming 2100 kilo calories on an average but what about the people at the top 20% they have no problem of purchasing power i have no problem of purchasing power my family has no problem of purchasing power but even family in the top income bracket and top expenditure classes you find there is a this if we use this as a indicator of food security or if we go to the extent of calling it hunger so you will find that even in the rich 20% 30% will be hungry so what is this do we need to look at india's food security india's nutrition from a different angle what frederick landy in uh, her, her book just said that indian culture and indian preferences can't be explained by these standard terminology and indicator we need to look at it differently but i am posing a question that if we are calling it hunger hunger and hungry then why the rich people prefer to remain hungry we need to look at it then uh i think uh, uh, i should uh, now come to jandra uh, seem to be uh, um, under pressure to leave so i just would like to uh, speak on this national food security act i agree with him that uh, national food security has many limitations and uh, uh, we need to uh, address particularly this uh, uh, question that uh, if we go for this act as such will it reduce hunger in india the way hunger is defined the answer seems to be it may reduce hunger but to a very small extent and the reason which i am giving is that this national food security act is cereal centric india's consumer do not have preference to increase consumption of cereals india's consumer you look at that except bottom 15 or 20% it is difficult to draw a line because you get 10% 10% 10% and 10%, don't know where does it occur one need to look at the unit household data that except for bottom 15% or 20% population you look at the cereal intake in rest of the expenditure classes by preference they have been reducing cereal consumption so if we give them cereal at a subsidized rate do you think they are going to consume more cereals i don't think so they will only substitute market purchases with pds supply they are not likely to consume more cereal because preference of people in india to consume cereal has been declining the per capita intake of cereal in most of the expenditure classes except bottom 15% so i would give guarded uh, reply to this that bottom 15 20% yes it may improve their nutrition because they may consume more cereal then they get it at subsidized rate and because of purchasing power they are not consuming adequate cereal but for rest of the population it will not result in increase in consumption of cereal therefore if this act is implemented for everyone that that universal kind of thing if it is not targeted i think the cost involved is too high and gain in nutrition seem to be too little and i also uh, agree with him that uh, that uh, that uh, in india should we think of subsidizing 
cereals all the time because i call that india's approach toward nutrition and food security is not food centric we start with talk of food then we come to food grain then we forget about pulses and so many thing it becomes cereal centric everything around cereal so if we want to understand improve nutrition of people in this country should we give them more cereal should we subsidize cereal or we should subsidize those food which consumer are interested to consume so these are some of the comments which i wanted to make thank you uh, thank you dr chand i know john you have, you have to leave so uh, do you have any quick there was a lot in there uh, that just seems to like you may want to respond but anything very quickly if you can uh, before you points, uh, out, yeah. i don't think we have said that 75% of people in India are undernourished. We have said that if you accept the traditional calorie norms of the Planning Commission and if you apply that to the national uh, NSS expenditure data, then this is what the picture that would emerge. But we have also quite strongly criticized the use of fixed calorie norms because the calorie requirements seem to vary so much depending on the context, the epidemiological environment, activity patterns, climate, and so on and so forth. So it's not particularly useful to have fixed calorie norms. So I, I wouldn't really want to these figures to be attributed to us. And uh, the last point you made about cereals, you know, I, I I don't think anyone claims that the purpose of the Food Security Act is to increase people's cereal consumption. That's not the main purpose. Uh, that's not the need that mo most people have. Some people, of course, uh, as I said, are still vulnerable to hunger in the sense of not even having rice or wheat on their plate. Um, but the, as I said, the purpose, at least in my mind, is partly that. Uh, more importantly, is providing economic security to people, which is also a route to better nutrition, but also to you know other forms of poverty reduction. And please remember that the poverty impacts are huge. I mean, Jitika presented some figures, uh, uh, which based on our, on our joint work, showing that the impact of ch the Chhattisgarh PDS on uh, poverty, traditional poverty measures like the poverty gap index, it reduces it by about 50 percent. So it's a, there's a huge impact on poverty in traditionally defined. And of course, as I said, the third third objective is to improve nutrition, partly through these child nutrition programs, maternity entitlements, and perhaps to some extent also through the PDS, to the extent that once you have a well-functioning PDS, then you can introduce also communities like pulses and oil, at least for, at least for certain categories like until their households, and that would also contribute to their better nutrition. So I, <laughs> I, w I agree that the Food Security Act will not have a big impact on cereal consumption, but I don't think that's the purpose. John has to leave, uh, so uh, uh, we'll, I guess, he has to leave now. Just w any burning question, everyone? From. Yeah. Okay, maybe we'll take a couple of questions, John. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, please. This broad clarification. This Food Security Act, if we have to implement properly, then we have to use the PDS as the vehicle. But uh, it's a bit hypothetical. Government is planning to use this direct benefit transfer to substitute PDS you know, directly. Uh, then what is the future of this uh, Food Security Act? How it would be really done? Of course, I understand this. Uh, that this uh, direct benefit transfers it is based on very weak foundations. It doesn't have any logic in many sense. But how do you go about this, implementing this Food Security Act? I know you want to leave, so I'll keep it very short. Uh, but it's a big question, actually. Uh, which is to say that India's food security debates have generally focused on these forms of transfers. But uh, if you look at food security debates globally, then there's much more in, uh, focus on food sovereignty and direct control over food, which is primarily then farmer-centric. So, um, and there's, you know, an environmental critique of the way in which um, these forms of cheap food policies call for in, you know, fossil fuel and water-intensive farming and, and the whole sort of environmental package that goes along with that. Why do you think in the Indian case, the food sovereignty aspects, which are farmer-centric, have not been focused on, whereas the cheap food aspect of it has been? The first question, I don't think India is ready for a system of cash transfers. Uh, whether at one point in the future it will be the right thing to do, I think 
you know, one can take different views on that. This is a long, long, long story and a long debate. But uh, if and when a, state co a stage comes where it seems to be appropriate, for example, initially maybe for urban areas or for states like Punjab where there's not much hunger in the basic sense of the term, the Food Security Act does not prevent that. In fact, there's a, there are three separate clauses in the act that would uh, uh, permit cash transfers. But then you'll have to do something about this. You know, all the people who are advocating cash transfer are very silent on this procurement. And are, are you saying that you will dismantle the procurement system? Is that the right thing to do? Or do you want to bring it down and then have a partial transfer to cash? You know, I think all this de debate will have to come uh, in due course. But the Food Security Act does not preclude cash transfer. So that, that, that debate, there's still space for that debate. Personally, I would be very opposed right now to any uh, phasing out of the PDS in favor of cash transfers. But I don't think food should continue forever either. I mean, I think that once people become more secure and richer uh, and the banking system improves and so on, there may be a point where that a point may come where actually they might prefer cash transfers. I, I don't have a kind of ideological uh, obs you know, fixation with food, but I feel for now. For now, we should use what we have and make it work. And then we'll see later whether thing, other things might work better. Uh, food sovereignty, as you say, is a long question. I think there is some talk of it in India. Actually, uh, I'm not sure if it's. I don't. I don't know if it's less than globally, but uh, I think there is some debate, and I think there are many valid issues that are raised. For example, about the impact of the PDS on millets and so on, and that's one reason why we have been trying to support the inclusion of millets in the PDS as well. But I do think that uh, ultimately, I mean, the ultimate objective is security and nutrition, and for that purpose, I don't think you can easily substitute for these programs of social security in one form or another. And I think sometimes there's a bit of an illusion that if you grow your own food, food, then you are secure. I think that's not true. I mean, growing your own food can be a very insecure thing to do. So um, I, that's not to dismiss the food sovereignty concerns, but I, I don't think that, I don't see them as you know one or the other. I think we need to think about both. I have to leave now. Sorry. Why don't you uh, get your remarks and then we'll open it up. Okay. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, I s I'm actually in a very unenvious kind of a situation because I'm standing uh, my, between the end of the session and your home, reaching home. <laughs> So I, uh, I I would really like to thank all of you for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity of uh, speaking to all of you out here. A very august, uh, learned gathering. Uh, and I was really thinking as to what should I be saying to all of you. Uh, you people are so knowledgeable in your fields. And I have got a very superficial uh, 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 comparatively superficial uh, knowledge on this and uh, I would like to just I just thought of it and I thought that the best thing to do is to bring to you certain points certain issues certain suggestions which uh, which could prod you into thinking about it and examine more deeply about farming about the farmers and how to mitigate those issues and the problems that uh, farming as such overall is facing. And by farming, of course, I have restricted myself uh, by and large to farming out here. I have not gone to the food security part of you know, the poultry and the meat uh, policy and things like that. But uh, it's a, just a short kind of a synopsis kind of thing. Probably we don't uh, realize as to how important farming is to humanity, to the populations. Uh, its prime responsibility is towards the populations. And the responsibility for successful ag agriculture depends on the willingness of a farmer to stay in village and work. This is something which a lot of us, we consume food every day, but we never think of it. We take it for granted. Now looking at the present situation, if you look at it, we have over 70% of our population, which is, uh, or maybe about 70%, the figures can vary here and there, 
uh, which is based or dependent on agriculture. And by agriculture, I mean the rural economy, the agricultural economy. And most of the farmers, so to say, who are there in the villages, they are either small or marginalized. And that figure works out to almost 84%. It's uh, written over 80%, but actually, it, if you calculate it, work out to about 84%. And given the kind of situation that they're facing, they would not like to depend on agriculture. Now, this does not augur well for food security. Now, the issues that the farmers face are probably known to all of you. One is the fragmentation of land. Uh, I'm, I belong to Uttar Pradesh and I have some land and I'm a bit connected with the agriculture over there. Uh, what I find over there is that this particular restriction of 12 acres per person uh, of land holding, uh, which further fragments when a farmer has two sons and it gets divided to six and further on, which leads to various problems, including uh, female feticide. This is something which uh, uh, one has to look at it. Then uh, you have this uh, perennial debt trap in which the farmers go through. Low yields, you know, per acre, I, I suppose, uh, our, in, compared to certain developed countries, we would be almost one-fifth of uh, uh, production as compared to those countries. Uh, there's electricity uh, shortage of electricity. Then we keep facing droughts. Droughts are not always uh, uh, droughts as well as uh, uh, we have floods. Now both could be connected also to the mismanagement of the funds which you get uh, for developing, maintaining and uh, remaking of the canals, irrigational canals. It doesn't, people, uh, there's a lot of graft out there, there's a lot of uh, cheating out there. So this money gets wasted, gets stolen. And then you have problems like uh, droughts and you have problems like floods because they are choked, the canals are choked and the water will flow out when there's more and they'll flood the fields. Lack of relevant education, non-remunerative farming because if you look at it, the MSP price uh, of cereals, uh, the cost inputs have gone up tremendously and uh, it has not really uh, it doesn't really sustain farming as such. Uh, lack of mechanization, of course. Uh, information, information is not available. Again, it's connected with uh, both IT and uh, also uh, connected to the education part of it. Now, information technology can really help the farmers over here. Uh, inadequate subsidy in case of crop loss or failure. Most, many a times, the amount calculated by the local authorities is much lower, very, very low. And these things can be mitigated by GPS system, GPS survey and uh, satellite survey. You can do all that. In this present situation, the farmers are also a group which is highly disorganized. They have no organization, no bargaining power, and they are also susceptible to exploitation by the middlemen. Which is all known to all of you, I'm just saying for the sake of it, trying to bring in a perspective. Now, all such pressures are leading uh, to the farmers selling their land and migrating to urban areas for non-agricultural livelihood. And the worst is suicides, you know, with all these debt traps and everything, they finally end up committing suicides. The number of suicides probably which have taken place, we have not lost so many people in wars till, <laughs> till now. Then you add to this the climate change and food security is under threat. Pressure on land and expected low yields with the warming as Recently, I read in some newspapers there was a leak, and I read a little bit of that. Uh, now, the resolutions uh, that to mitigate all these things could be to waive registration charges for consolidation. 
uh, the heavy, uh, uh, I would say, uh, registration charges for if, if farmers want to, they, they are willing to consolidate that land kind of and work together, but uh, it's, it's become prohibitive because the registration charges are very high. Uh, review policies on maximum land holding, cooperatives, indirect, you know, uh, through FDI also, if, if FDI had come, it could have probably helped in uh, uh, bringing about a kind of a cooperative movement of sorts. Then, of course, linking of rivers has been hanging fire for quite some time. Drip irrigation is something which is very successful wherever it's been implemented, but it's a question of implementing it. Effective water harvesting for har urban areas. You see, there's so much of water which is wasted, which is never harvested, say in Delhi. And we keep trying about, and people win elections over free supplies of water, promise of free supply of water. But you can imagine how important it is. <coughs> And that much water which is free can be used for irrigation. Uh, information technology, as I said earlier, farm mechanization. There are a lot of this young rural uh, workforce, uh, the younger generations in, in, in the villages, who are not willing to do labor on the farms. So I think there, there is something which we require, some, some kind of mechanization. We, we, we need to have some kind of cooperatives or things like that. One, one has to think on those lines. Then linking of, uh, this is a very important uh, point that I would like to suggest, uh, and that is linking of uh, Manrega with farming. <coughs> you see, this, this Manrega has also led to the rise in the cost of labor for the farms. And uh, uh, what uh, we are trying to suggest out here is that 50% uh, of the working days of Mandrika should be linked to farming activity. And here the farmers would pay 50% of that uh, wages uh, to the laborers. So this is a suggestion which is there. Now uh, it's for uh, you experts to think over it and uh, take it forward maybe uh, as a policy issue. Uh, resolution and su suggestions also have things like compulsory insurance. They, they are all risk mitigation. The next one, let me not change. The direct cash subsidy to farmers, pension for all farmers over 60 years of age. Now you organize the farmers, and then definitely you can do something about it. There is over 70. Just giving pension to say some 10 percent or 15 percent of the population is good. But what about Come to think of it, once he reaches 60 years of age, you and with the kind of health uh, facilities available, do you expect that farmer to be really working? He works 24 by 7. He has got no Sundays, no holidays. Then there, there's uh, this uh, credit at low interest rates. We can think of giving credit to farmers at 4% interest rates. And there are certain studies which say that the um, uh, recovery of loans by the banks from farmers is almost about 95% as compared, and you compare it that with the industrial, more organized sectors, industry. It is, that is much lower. I don't know, we are still carrying on with the Essential Commodities Act, which is of no use. Uh, and why? And the biggest one that we have, we would like to suggest, have a separate union budget for agriculture. Bring that focus. Yeah, why not? Why not? Have a separate union budget. Bring that focus. Why not bring that focus to it? And there are a lot of people who talk about organic farming and all that. There, there are a lot of people who uh, 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 talk about not using the pesticides, but then uh, look at pesticides. They are like any organ, uh, cereals or any any uh, uh, farm uh, product is like is an organic uh, uh, entity, like any human being. When you fall sick, you require medicines. So why don't you look at pesticides as a as a medicine for the for the for uh, crops? Now. The most uh, 
important thing about uh, the farmers that is uh, is that uh, the minimum support price they really go by this the minimum support price at least in the Hindi heartland and and between 2004 it is, it is just to bring your perspective if you look at it the fertilizer prices increased 300 percent then you had the labor cost which increased by 400 percent pesticides 500 percent MPs and MLA's salaries increased by 500 percent government employee salaries increased by 300 percent steel cement cloth soap they all gone up by 300 percent but the price of wheat paddy cotton oil seeds increased by only 100 percent why this discrimination so our suggestion is that the first thing to do is implement the NS, NCF report of Dr. M. S. Swaminathan. This cost of production plus 50 percent should be implemented by the government. And the, another thing is to get the right figures, the right prices, right calculation, make CSEP an autonomous body, not under a government decision. You know, uh, about a couple of months back, I was listening to Dr. Debroy, and uh, he was talking on various problems of the farmers and how to go about it. And his opening remarks were that the first thing that should be done is abolish Ministry of Agriculture. You don't need it. <laughs> Liberalize farm sector liberalize agriculture you liberalize it and by limiting procurement you allow free internal trading and export policies Ad adopting new technologies that are available in the world why restrict today does anybody stop me from taking uh, 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 when I'm working for Tata Steel uh, does anybody stop me from using a laptop or uh, 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 any other uh, technical tool to work but by the farmers, if he wants to import a technology, why not? If they want to use uh, much, much maligned BT cotton, which has been a success, why just the imported technology? Our own scientists have de developed very, um, uh, um, very good hybrid uh, mustard se uh, seeds, which, for, uh, which have been tried in Rajasthan, and they are so successful, they are so useful. Uh, they've increased the uh, crop uh, many times, three to four, five times in certain areas. But that is also banned by the government. They've put a blanket ban on use of uh, any uh, genetically modified uh, seeds. Now that's rather unfair. So free this sector totally. And the moment you allow them to grow what they want to, as long as you allow them allow investments through FDI and everything to come in in encourage investments in irrigation and every things will f fall in place you will have situations where you will have situations where things will balance out the demand and supply will balance out the pricing it will balance out the uh, uh, unnecessary sale of agriculture uh, agri arable land it, with, for uh, for non-agricultural usage, so we need to do something to liberalize and and our request to the thinkers, intellectuals, and everyone is that you got to support the farmers and you must give them recognition. Why can't we have a Padma Shri award for a good farmer, for innovative farmer? Why can't why, you can have for sports? You you can have, but why not something to recognize the farmers also? It is ridiculous, absolutely. They work, they toil, and they are skilled laborers. They are not unskilled laborers. And to sum it up, or not really sum it up, but. Uh, uh, just, just give a thought to this. The country can survive 100 wars, but it cannot survive 100 days of food rights. 
and then don't be despondent the farmers also have an assurance give us technologies we will increase productivity make investments we will make it sustainable give us freedom to market we will increase profitability empower farmers we will become globally competitive thank you everybody a chance to talk to each other perhaps but before you know people should have a chance who have been sitting quite patiently. Uh, so we're just going to open the floor for any questions that you may have for Dr. Chang or Mr. Singh. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, Professor Ramesh Chang, the first uh, of course I agree with you very much that the policy is too serial centric. And uh, in that context, my question is about this Food Security Act. Uh, um, you know, I mean, even the poorer sections know that we draw much of our nutrition from non-cereal products. It's not only the richer people, everybody knows that. And uh, as you are all saying that people will move out of agriculture, they want to move out, land will move out. You may increase if you are saying, but when we don't know. So will this not in the short or medium term give an incentive to the farmer to move from diversification or other crops towards cereals and distort the production pattern? And uh, the second uh, is to Professor Sanjay, I think uh, it was too thought provoking <laughs> and very interesting. But I have a small question, I mean other things are left to the uh, wider audience to think about. Uh, this uh, Narega uh, you have suggested. Um, but uh, my question is that I know in the Ministry of Agriculture and this cycle, this question often arises that wages are rising and uh, this thing. But the idea you are giving, since this will be paid for by the state government, uh, there will be a problem. There not be a problem of the distribution of who will get the services. Again, that may lead to some kind of conflict. Uh, and how you have thought about it, I don't know. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, like maybe we can take a couple more and then we'll get a chance to uh, uh, promote, yes. Actually, I had uh, two, three questions to John DeVries, but he has left, so no use of asking question for uh, him. Uh, I have uh, one comment on the, the calorie intake uh, as far as uh, cereal consumption, uh, uh, if we compare India with the other developing and developed countries, I think uh, the paradox which Professor Ramesh Chand has talked about uh, the why the cereal consumption is declining in India and uh, it's uh, a paradox which is unanswerable even in the higher bracket we are consuming less our calorie intake is, uh, uh, it is across the board that our cal calorie intake is much lower compared to the world average, all the developed countries. But uh, probably the answer lies somewhere, the diet pattern in India. I don't know if any other country in the whole world, so much vegetarian population exists anywhere. Our consumption, I was, uh, I have a paper uh, where I have seen the human consumption and indirect use of cereals, even uh, uh, oil, oil seeds, edible oils. The difference between the uh, the indirect consumption or feed that we have in India, it doesn't compare anywhere, with even countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, the uh, all those countries, uh, East Asia, whole East Asia is uh, meat consuming and the, the cereals going for feed, it is uh, almost 28 kg, 30 kg, in US it is uh, more than 50 kg per capita. So I think that is where our consumption of uh, calorie intake because of uh, almost 50, 60% population being vegetarian, we are not 
consuming as much in the indirect use which other countries have. That is what makes a lot of difference in the total consumption of cereals. Their uh, overall average in the case of India it comes much lower than the other parts. FAO has this data on uh, human consumption and uh, indirect seed feed whatever uh, you keep in that. And I don't know how scientific data is but whatever official figures they put like uh, for India they have put 12.5% uh, that, is, that is what our official figure is. Maybe the, that figure itself is uh, uh, lower down because we are keeping that figure in the even for the planning commission uh, uh, our forecast. But ultimately the uh, all meat consuming countries they are consuming cereals in indirectly through feed much much higher compared to India and that is where I think difference lies. Yes. Yeah, thank you Mr. Singh for giving a different perspective. You know you have given several suggestions. Now historically if we see the production of agriculture has always been in the private hand, in the hand of farmers what to produce and uh, uh, you know the production part is by and large it is left to the farmers. But the problem was the government intervention in the market and also in the trade. Now if we say, you know, let, you know, the way you are telling, let Minister of Agriculture close down, if we say, let government withdraw completely from the agriculture, do you think, you know, from your own perspective or your own experience, do you think a radical situation, solution like that will solve some of the problems? One more, okay, and then we will... Uh, actually, you know, it's, uh, you have raised a series of normative concerns. And, you know, uh, some are good, acceptable, and, you know, and some are really controversial, to be frank with you. For instance, opening up of uh, the agriculture, when you say the use consolidation, quote, and unquote, okay, and for opening it up for FDI and the cooperatives through multinationals and so on, it's really going to destroy our small holders. 60%, you, you, you have been sort of, uh, you know, in the heart of uh, the agriculture sector and talking to farmers and so on. You know that such a large segment of our farmers belong to a small and marginal category. So they are going to become pauper if you are going to open it up to the multinationals and FBI. You know what's happening in Ethiopia and East Africa. So that is one. And secondly, the river linking project itself is a very controversial thing, highly political, controversial. The ecologists are opposing it, environmentalists are opposing it, and many, many states are opposing it. The loser states are opposing and gainer states are welcoming it. So these are very controversial projects and the, 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 the GM products, genetically, genetically modified, again very controversial. You may have the data about the BT cotton, but then uh, others, uh, other states have got different versions of the story. So those are again very controversial. But then even normative concerns, like, you know, uphold agriculture sector, uphold farmers, by and large, you know, so to view, to hear that particular viewpoint is, 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 is actually, you know, I mean, very nice to hear. I mean, I like it. But otherwise, you know, some of the issues that you raise are very controversial. Okay, so maybe we'll start with uh, the brief response and then we'll move to I'll give a brief response to uh, what I had said. Uh, well, starting with the uh, lady's uh, question on Mandrika, the idea as to who is going to use the services of the people who are getting the benefit of Mandrika. Uh, I had mentioned about 50% of the time to be used for farm activity instead of just making roads or something like that. And that, that and during that period, that 50% of the time when they're working on the farm, the farmers are going to pay for it so that they also don't get it free. This is basically to subsidize the higher cost of labor and non-availability of labor. Manrega is causing both non-availability of labor and higher cost input. So that was one. Now, with regard to uh, this, uh, uh, sir, what was your question? Uh, sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. You see, I started. It was a, it was a very uh, extreme and uh, kind of uh, with cynicism that Professor Debroy had mentioned this, and I repeated that 
when when he I, I quoted as he said okay, why don't we just abolish ministry of agriculture now that is in a way you know taking a very cynical view of it uh, of course he never also suggested that to abolish ministry of agriculture but the idea was to bring about as much decrease as much control as possible in terms of market uh, um, uh, uh, in terms of supply chain you know try and reduce that uh, sir uh, coming to you with regard to uh, small holders having small they in any case impoverished the small small holders so <laughs> no no but no i am not saying that at all you please listen to me it depends how you bring it, bring in an fdi how you bring in an fdi when you bring in an fdi one is they will have direct access you require technologies and seats and all that to come in improved seats the the fdi in retail the fdi the mnc is supposed to bring that it could be a national it need not be an fdi it could be a national company it could be tata as it could be uh, reliance but they will be able to form them into a kind of a cooperative and say that okay fine you make potato chips for a, enough potato at least he is getting the price that he wants to get he doesn't have to go and sell products in the market through the dalal he gives it to that lala and the lala at the um, uh, uh, at the dead of the night says the market gir gaya ye ho gaya ek kachcha parchi kaat ke dega and uh, that amount is uh, uh, even below the market rates so they are getting cheated then you have the uh, 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 they are uh, trapped in debts, and, and most of these uh, uh, loans that they take are uh, non-productive. They are basically for social reasons that they are taking for bache ki shadi hai, for a, for a marriage, or for some other reasons he is taking, which he can never pay. So this is we have to get them out. How do we bring money into it? That that is how we look at it. It is controversial. I agree. You can have a different point of view, and a lot of debates have taken place on this. and i think that this is what we feel with regard to uh linking of rivers this is something which was thought about maybe 50 years ago also 60 years ago also and uh, you have situations where there are heavy floods floods damaging the crops and there are certain places where you don't have a drop of water but you have the rivers out there why can't we channel those waters so that we can we can have a proper uh, irrigated uh, lands the productivity will go up everything now this is our point of view again yes i agree a lot of people have there are a lot of controversies over it gm genetically modified cereals uh, seeds and all that our children are studying in us a lot of people our age group also they are living in us what is the food you are getting out there it's all <laughs> genetically modified food abroad they are all they are sab theek hai un log ka health ko kuch nahi hua they are all okay we have, i think it's a it's a bogey that's what i feel <laughs> that's our view so actually i i'm just going to sort of uh, let uh, can i just add one more thing since you raised a lot of issue around definition and measurement uh, i don't know how uh, mostly uh, uh, food economists uh, work around on, but you have anthropometry so uh, and uh, i think uh, why not just measure that in terms of per capita availability uh, and i think increasingly you know that's where the attention started coming uh and uh, when we look at the anthropometry indians do not there is no puzzle <laughs> it's pretty clear like you know, they consume less so they are uh, they have a lower anthropometry so just a thought there why why stick to this very uh vague measures of consumption expenditure and why not just measure like you know and and if you take an indian who's moved elsewhere they look different so so we know that there is nothing special about indians or indian kids in terms of their growth so uh what i like in fact uh, anthropometric measure they are not indicator of food security they are outcome of whatever we do and they involve so many factors 
I am sure you have seen a recent uh, paper by, um, uh, I forgot name of the author, that the main reasons for high child mortality and high, this stunting and wastage of children is open defecation in India. It is not so much to do with nutrition. Nutrition no, is I, important. That's not what no, no. That's Pierce. Robert paper. Chamber. There is so a paper by Robert Chamber in EPW so three or four. Huh? So there's Pierce who works here, who has done a lot ah, of work ah. in the School of Economics. Yeah, yeah. He says there are three factors. Yeah. You know, there is food. Then yeah, there is yeah. Uh, of course, the but food alone. Like if there's you take example, food. this you look at calorie intake, etc. In Kerala, it is much lower than dietary energy intake in many other states of India. But nutrition outcome in Kerala are much better than many other states. So just to focus on food, 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 and we give example of South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa also. In fact, food intake in India is much higher than what it is in Sub-Saharan Africa. But still, you find that our this child mortality rate and all those things, they are much higher. So we need to pay attention to other aspects also. Sanitation, clean water, medical health, like that. They are also, uh, uh, to my mind, equally important. Now coming to point raised by Nilavja, in fact, in agriculture, already those kind of things are happening. Uh, some are the continuation from last several years, but recent phenomena, 11 census and also 11, 12 and 9, 10 NSSO data, it shows that the number of worker in agriculture has already started declining. And if you look at share of cereal in the total output, it is declining at a rapid rate. And the last year, first time, production of horticulture product in India, fruit and vegetable, is 268 million ton. And production of food grain is only 260 million ton. But we don't recognize because as I mentioned, we start with food, come down to food grain, then end up discussing what is happening to rice and wheat. Rice and wheat are important, cereals are important, they are basic staple. But our obsession with them is something which is doing harm. Over time, when economy grows, you know that dietary pattern has to diversify. So we are not maintaining that balance. We started National Food Security Mission. What was its focus? Rice, wheat, cereals and pulses. It did not focus on other kind of food on which consumer preference is rising. So rice and wheat will remain important. They account for two-third of energy supply, two-third of even protein supply. But other food over time, relatively, that relative importance of other food, because of change in consumption pattern, so many reasons, is, is very, very important. And that is that in the policy, you just find that MSP for rice and wheat, effective MSP. You look at other crops. It is only notional. <laughs> it's not uh, uh, effective. So we need to balance our policy, we need to balance our approach. Cereal are important, so are other commodity and bring that balance in, uh, in our policy that 30 years back it is okay that even when cereals were also not available. But today's situation is different. Today India produce more milk than India produce rice. You look at 20 years back, what was the situation? India produce only two-third of milk compared to rice. But today it produce 25% more milk then what is the rice production? And I tell you, told you about horticulture products, 264 million ton, more than what is the total production of food grain. And it is, most of it is demand driven. It is not that government is supporting. So demand factor play their own role. And government policy, in some cases wrong policy, is trying to put a break on this process. That we will not uh, allow this process to grow at a faster rate. So we will give more support to cereal, even if consumer don't want, we will keep 80 million ton in our grain. And if the offtake doesn't take place, we will give at 2 rupees a kg. And seeing a positive aspect of NFSA, that okay, it is helping in clearance of that stock. First of all, why we have to create that stock? Huh? Then we are seeking solace in this aspect that NFSA will result in clearance of those kind of stocks. So we need to have our food policy, which is consistent with what are the demand preferences. It was okay with India 30 years back to equate its food security with grain security. Today we need to look at importance of milk, importance of egg, and so many other kind of that balanced uh, nutrition uh, uh, kind of thing is very important. And briefly, Pramod, 
we need not catch up with developed country but we certainly need to improve and that rate of improvement is very very important that why uh, our our this uh, nutrition improvement is very slow hmm? we may not uh, consume 3200 kilo calorie which uh, average american level or level of europe and like that but we should be consuming at least minimum 2100 Uh, 80 calorie that is what is the norm so this is what i was saying thank you excellent uh, i think maybe we should uh, call it a day i would just like to add uh, i i no okay, i just want just to i would like to add to what you had said uh, one is uh, the dietary uh, 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 yes diversification is taking place and the other thing is that uh, uh, i just wanted to add we are we have been talking about nutrition and all that now in rice and potato like nutrition is not there but answering your questions up uh, also add, uh, adding to that the gm the genetically modified uh, cereals uh, you can have uh, pro protein added to rice and potato you can have uh, crops which will uh, which are resistant to flooding and submersion and droughts so there are certain advantages thank you uh, thank you everyone you know uh, for this uh, excellent session clearly a lot of provocative uh, thinking and thoughts uh, we wish john was here uh, but if not uh, let me sort of uh, please join me in uh, thanking uh, dr khan mr singh and and other participants here yeah.